consider it no more. I was rude. Santa Maria, I almost threw you, too. But she added with a dazzling smile, you must not punish me as you have heard. Besides, this unlooked-for incident had driven from his mind the more important object of his visit, the discovery of the assailants of Richards and Colonel Starbottle. His inquiries of the Ramirez produced no result. Senna Ramirez was not aware of any suspicious loiterers among the frequenters of the Fonda, and except from some drunken American or Irish revelers he had been free of disturbance. Ah, uh, the peen and old Vaporo was not an angle, truly, but he was dangerous only to the bull and the wild horses, and he was afraid even of Cota. Mr. Ray was fain to ride home empty of information. He was still more concerned a week later, on returning unexpectedly one afternoon to his sanctum, to hear a musical, childish voice in the composing room. It was Cota she was there, as Richards explained, on his invitation, to view the marvels and mysteries of printing at a time when they would not be likely to disturb Mr. Gray at his work. But the beaming face of Richards and the simple tenderness of his blue eyes plainly revealed the sudden growth of an evidently sincere passion, and the unwanted splendors of his... Gray was worried and perplexed, believing the girl a malicious flirt. Yet nothing could be more captivating than her simple and childish curiosity, as she watched Richards swing the lever of the press, or stood by his side as he marshaled the type into files, the editor might have become quite sentimental and poetical had he not noticed that the gray eyes which often rested tentatively and meaningly on himself, even while apparently listening to Richards. He withdrew presently so as not to interrupt his foreman's innocent tete-a-tete, but it was not very long after that Cota passed him on the high road with the pinto horse in a gallop, and blew him in a day. For several days afterwards Richards's manner was tinged with a certain reserve on the subject of Cota which the editor attributed to the delicacy of a serious affection, but he was surprised also to further discussion regarding it naturally dropped, and the editor was beginning to lose his curiosity when it was suddenly awakened by a chance incident. An intimate friend and old companion of his one in Riquist Saltillo, had diverged from a mountain trip especially to call upon him. Enriquez was a scion of one of the oldest Spanish California families, and in addition to his friendship for the editor, it pleased him also to affect an intense admiration of American ways and habits. It seemed, therefore, quite natural to Mr. Gray to find him seated with his feet on the editorial desk, his hat cocked on the back of his head, reading the clarion exchanges but he was up in a moment, and had embraced Gray with characteristic effusion. I find myself, my little brother, but an hour ago two leagues from this spot, I say to myself, Hola, it is the home of Don Panco, my friend, I shall find him composed. Saltillo knew the Spanish population thoroughly, his own superior race, and their Mexican and Indian allies. If any one could solve the mystery of the Ramirez Fonda, and discover Richards's unknown assailant. It was he, but Gray contented himself, at first, with a few brief... Enriquez was as briefly communicative. Of your suspicions, my little brother, you are right on the half. That little angle of a cota is, without doubt, the daughter of the adorable Senora Ramirez, but not of the admirable... Ah, what would you? We are a simple, patriarchal race. These Ramirez... He was the Mexican tenant of the old Spanish landlord such as my father, and we are ever the father. It is possible, therefore, that the exquisite Cota resemble the Spanish landlord. A stop remained tranquil, I remember. He went on, suddenly striking his forehead with a dramatic gesture. The old owner of these ranch was my cousin Tiburcio. Of a consequence, my friend. These angle is my second cousin. Behold, I shall call there on the instant. I shall embrace my long-lost relation. I shall introduce my best friend, Don Panco, who loathe her. I shall say, bless you, my children, and it is fiendish. I go, I am gone even now. He started up and clapped on his hat, but Gray caught him by the arm. For heaven's sake, Enriquez, be serious for once, he said, forcing him back into the chair and don't speak so loud. 
The foreman in the other room is an enthusiastic admirer of the girl. In fact, it is on his account that I am making these inquiries, and the gentleman of the pantofloss, whose trousers will not remain, I have seen him, friend. Truly he has the ambition excessive to arrive from the bed to go to the work without the dress or the wash. But, in recognition of Gray's half-serious impatience, remain tranquil. On him I shall not go back, I have said. The friend of my friend is ever the same as my friend. He is truly not seducing to the eye, but without doubt he will arrive a governor. Or I shall give to him my second cousin. It is Fiendish. I will tell him now. He attempted to rise, but was held down and vigorously shaken by Gray. I've half a mind to let you do it, and get chucked through the window for your pains, said the editor, with a half laugh. Listen to me. This is a more serious matter than you suppose. And Gray briefly recounted the incident of the mysterious attacks on Starbottle and Richards. As he proceeded, he noticed, however, that the ironical light died out of Enrique's eyes, and a singular thoughtfulness, yet unlike his usual precise gravity, came over his face. He twirled the ends of his pensile, mustaching, an unfailing sign of Enrique's emotion. The same accident that arrived to two men that shall be as opposite as the gallant Starbottle and the excellent Richards shall not prove that it come from Ramirez, though they both were at the Fonda, he said, The cause of it have not come today, nor yesterday, nor last week. The cause of it have arrived before there was any gallant Starbottle or excellent Richards. Before there was any American in California, before you and I, my little brother, have left the cause. It is so, he went on gravely. It is an old story, it is a long story. I shall make him short and new. He stopped and lit a cigarette without changing his odd expression. It was when the Pedras first have the mission, and take the heathen, and convert him, and save his soul. It was their business, you comprehend, my panko. The more heathen they convert, the more soul they save, the better business for their mission shop. But the heathen do not always wish to be convert. The heathen fly, the heathen skedaddle, the heathen will not remain, or will backslide. What will you do? So the holy fathers make a little game. You do not of a possibility comprehend how the holy fathers make a convert, my little brother, he added gravely. No, said the editor. I shall tell to you. They take from the presidio five or six dragons, you comprehend? the cavalry soldiers, and they pursue the heathen from his little hut. When they cannot surround him and he fly, they catch him with the lasso, like the wild hoss. The lasso catch him around the neck. He is obliged to remain. Sometime he is strangled. Sometime he is dead, but the soul is safe. You believe not, Hanko. I see you wrinkle the bro, you flash the eye. You like it not. Believe me, I like it. One time a pater who have the zeal excessive for the saving of soul, when he find the heathen, who is a young girl, have escaped the soldiers, he of himself have seized the lasso and fled. On the instant she have gone, and so have the pater. For why? It is not a young girl he have lasso, but the devil, you comprehend, it is a punishment, a retribution. He is fiendish, and forever, for every year he he is condemned ever to play his little game. Now there is no heathen more to convert. He catch what he can. My grandfather have once seen him. It is night and a storm, and he pass by like a flash. My grandfather like it not, he is much dissatisfied. My uncle have seen him. A vacuero of my father and a peen of my cousin have both been picked up, lassoed, and dragged dead. Many peoples have died of him in the strangling. Sometime he is seen, sometime it is the woman only that one sees, sometime it is but the hoss. But ever somebody is dead, strangle of a truth, my friend. The gallant Starbottle and the ambitious Richards have just escaped. The editor looked curiously at his friend. There was not the slightest suggestion of mischief or irony in his tone or manner. Nothing, indeed, but a sincerity and anxiety usually rare with his temperament. 
It struck him also that his speech had but little of the odd California slang which was always a part of his imitative levity. He was puzzled. Do you mean to say that this superstition is well known? He asked after a pause. Among my people, yes. And do you believe in it? And Rickwiz was silent. Then he arose and shrugged his shoulders. Quien Sabe, it is not more difficult to comprehend than your story. He gravely put on his hat. With it he seemed to have put on his old levity. Come, behold, it is a long time between drinks. Let us to the hotel and the barkeep, who shall give up the smash of brandy and the julep of mints before the lasso of Friar Pedro shall prevent. Gray returned to the clarion office in a much more satisfied condition of mind. Whatever faith he held in Enriquez's sincerity, for the first time since the attack on Colonel Starbottle he believed he had found a really legitimate journalistic opportunity in the incident. The legend and its singular coincidence with the outrages would make capital copy. No names would be mentioned. Yet even if Colonel Starbottle recognized his own adventure, he could not the editor had found that few people objected to be the hero of a ghost story or the favored witness of a spiritual manifestation. Nor could Richards find fault with this view of his own experience, hitherto kept a secret, so long as it did not refer to his relations with the fair Cota. Summoning him at once to his sanctum, he briefly repeated the story he had just heard and his purpose of using it. To his surprise, Richards's face assumed a seriousness and anxiety equal to Enriquez's own. It's a good story, Mr. Gray, he said awkwardly, and I ain't saying it ain't mighty good newspaper stuff, but it won't do now for the whole mysteries up and the assailant found, found. When, why didn't you tell me? I didn't reckon you were so keen on it, said Richards embarrassedly, and, and it wasn't my own secret altogether. Go on, said the editor impatiently. Well, said Richards, slowly and doggedly. Ye see, there was a fool that was sweet on Cota, and he allowed himself to be bediviled by her to ride her cursed pink and yellow must. Naturally, the beast bolted at once, but he managed to hang on by the mane for half a mile or so when it took to buck jumpin'. The first buck threw him clean into the road, but didn't stun him, yet when he tried to rise, the first thing he knowed he was grabbed from behind and half choked by somebody. He was held so tight that he couldn't turn, but he managed to get out his revolver and fire two shots under his arm. The grip held on for a minute, and then loosened, and the something slumped down on top of him, but he managed to work himself around. And then, what do you think he saw? Why, that their hoss, with two bullet holes in his neck, lying beside him but still gripping his coat collar and neck handkerchief in his teeth. Undoubtedly Cota had saved him from a similar attack. But why not tell this story with the other? said the editor, returning to his first idea. It's tremendously interesting. It won't do, said Richards, with dogged resolution. Why, because Mr. Gray, that fool was myself. You again attacked. Yes, said Richards with a darkening face. Again attacked, and by the same hoss. Cota's hoss, whether Cota was or was not knowing its tricks, she was actually furious at me for killing it, and it's all over twixt me. Look at the attack on you in the road. Richards shook his head with dogged hopelessness. It's no use, Mr. Gray. I ought to guessed it was a hoss then. There was nothing else in that coral. No, Cota's already gone away back to San Joe's, and I reckon the Ramirez has got scared of her and packed her off. So, on account of its being her hoss, and what happened betwixt me and her, you see my mouth is shut. And the columns of the clarion, too, said the editor. I know it's hard, sir, but it's better so. I've reckoned Meb she was a little crazy, and since you've told me that Spanish yarn, it might be that she was sort of plain she was that priest, and trained that musting as she did. Yes, sir, I was a fool, for we've lost the only bit of real sensation news that ever came in the way of the clarion. A Jack and Jill of the Sierras, the western sun, streaming down the mile-long slope of close-set pine crests, 
had been caught on an outlying ledge of glaring white quartz, covered with mining tools and debris. The air above it shimmered and became visible. A white canvas tent on it was an object not to be borne. The steel-tipped picks and shovels intolerable to touch an eyesight. And a tilted tin prospecting pan fall. At such moments the five members of the Yurka Mining Company prudently withdrew to the nearest pine tree which cast a shadow so sharply defined on the glistening sand that the impingement of a hand or finger beyond, the men lay or squatted in this shadow, feverishly puffing their pipes and waiting for the sun to slip beyond the burning ledge. Yet so irritating was the dry air, fragrant with the aroma of the heated pines, that occasionally one would start up and walk about until he had brought on that profuse perspiration which gave a moment. Suddenly a voice exclaimed querulously, Durned if the blasted bucket ain't empty agin, not a drop left. By Jiminy, a stare of helpless disgust was exchanged by the moment who brought the last, demanded the foreman. I did, said a reflective voice coming from a partner lying comfortably on his back. And if anybody reckons I'm going to face tough at Egan down that slope, he's mistaken. The speaker will. We must throw round for it, said the foreman, taking the dice from his pocket. He cast. The lowest number fell to Parkhurst, a florid, full-blooded Texan. All right, gentlemen, he said, wiping his forehead and lifting the tin pail with a resigned air, only if anything comes to me on that bare stretch of stage road, I'll risk it. Cries of good old Ned and hunky boy greeted him as he took the pail from the perspiring Parkhurst, who at once lay down again. You mayn't be a professin' Christian, in good standin', Ned Bray, continued Parkhurst from the ground, but you were about as white as they make em, and you were going to do a heavenly act. Thus equipped, he passed through the outer fringe of pines to a rocky trail which began to descend towards the stage road. Here he was in the full glare of the sun and its reflection from the heated rocks, which scorched his feet and pricked his bent face into a rash. The descent was steep and necessarily slow from the slipperiness of the desiccated pine needles that had fallen from above. Nor were his troubles over when, a few rods further, he came upon the stage road, which here swept in a sharp curve round the flank of the mountain, its red dust. Yet there were two hundred yards of this road to be passed before he could reach that point of its bank where a narrow and precipitous trail dropped diagonally from it to creep along the mountain side to the spring. When he reached the trail, he paused to take breath and wipe the blinding beads of sweet from his eyes before he cautiously swung himself over the bank into it. A single misstep here would have sent him headlong to the tops of pine trees a thousand feet below. Holding his pail in one hand, with the other he steadied himself by clutching the ferns and brambles at his side and at last reached the spring a niche in the mountain side with a ledge scarce. He had merely accomplished the ordinary gymnastic feat performed by the members of the Yurka Company four or five times a day, but the day was exceptionally hot. He held his wrists to cool their throbbing pulses in the clear, cold stream that gurgled into its rocky basin. He threw the water over his head and shoulders. He swung his gentle and delicious rigors came over him. He sat with half-closed eyes looking across the dark olive depths of the canyon between him and the opposite mountain. A hawk was swinging lazily above it, apparently within a stone's throw of him. He knew it was at least a mile away. Thirty feet above him ran the stage road. He could hear quite distinctly the slow thud of hoofs, the dull jar of harness, and the labored creaking of the pioneer coach as it crawled up. He thought of it a slow drifting cloud of dust and heat. As he had often seen it, abandoned by even its passengers, who sought shelter in the wayside pines as they toiled behind it, it had passed out of hearing and thought, he had turned to fill his pail, when he was startled by a shower of dust and gravel from the road above, and the next moment he was thrown violently down. His last flash of consciousness was that he had been struck by a sack of flour slipped from the pack of some passing mule. How long he remained unconscious he never knew. It was probably not long, for his chilled hands and arms, thrust by the blow on his shoulders into the pool of water, a 
assisted in restoring him. He came to with a sense of suffocating pressure on his back, but his head and shoulders were swathed in utter darkness by the folds of some soft fabrics and draperies, which to his connecting con With a tremendous effort he succeeded in getting his arm out of the pool, and attempted to free his head from its blinding and wrappings. In doing so his hand suddenly touched human flesh a soft, bared arm, with the same astounding discovery came one more terrible. That arm belonged to... Suddenly she began to stare at him, to draw in her knees and feet toward her sideways, with a feminine movement, as she smoothed out her skirt, and kept it down with a hand. She was a tall, handsome girl, from what he could judge of her half-sitting figure in her torn silk-dust cloak, which, although its cape and one sleeve were split into ribbons, she was evidently a lady. What is it what has happened? She said faintly, yet with a slight touch of formality in her manner. You must have fallen from the road above, said Bray hesitatingly. From the road above, she repeated, with a slight frown, as if to concentrate her thought. She glanced upward, then at the ledge before her, and then, for the first time, at the darkening abyss below. The color, which had begun to return, suddenly left her face here, and she drew instinctively back against the mountain side. Yes, she half murmured to herself, rather than to him, it must be so. I was walking too near the bank, and I fell. Then turning to him, she said, and you found me lying here when you came. I think, stammered Bray, that I was here. She lifted her handsome gray eyes to him, saw the dust, dirt, and leaves on his back and shoulders, the collar of his shirt torn open, and a few spots of blood from a bruise on her black eyebrows straightened again as she said coldly, Dear me, I am very sorry. I couldn't help it, you know. I hope you are not otherwise hurt. No he replied quickly. But you, are you sure you are not injured? It must have been a terrible shock. I'm not hurt, she said, helping herself to her feet by the aid of the mountainside bush. But, she added quickly and impressively, glancing upward toward the stage road overhead, why don't they come? They must have missed me. I must have been here a long time. Yes, she said impatiently, of course. I wasn't alone. Don't you understand? I got out of the coach to walk a fill on the bank under the trees. It was so hot and stuffy. My foot must have slipped up there, and I slid down. Have you heard anyone calling me? Have you called out yourself? Mr. Bray did not like to say he had only just recovered consciousness. He smiled vaguely and foolishly, but on turning around in her impatience, she caught sight of the chasm again, and lapsed quite white against the mountain side. Let me give you some water from the spring, he said eagerly, as she sank again to a sitting posture. It will refresh you. He looked hesitatingly around him. He had neither... She drank a little, extracted a lace handkerchief from some hidden pocket, dipped its point in the water, and wiped her face delicately, after a certain filine fashion. Then, catching sight of some small object in the fork of a bush above her, she quickly pounced upon it, and with a swift sweep of her hand under her skirt, put on her fallen slip. How does one get out of such a place? She asked fretfully. And then, glancing at him half indignantly, why don't you shout? I was going to tell you. Somehow, with this tall, beautiful creature beside him, it looked more perilous than before. She may have thought so, too, for she drew in her brief sharply and sank down again. Is there no other way? None. How did you happen to be here? She asked suddenly, opening her gray eyes upon him. What did you come here for? She went on, almost impertinently, to fetch a pail of water. He stopped and then it suddenly occurred to him that after all there was no reason for his being bullied by this tall, good-looking girl, even if he He gave a little laugh, and added mischievously, just like Jack and Jill, you know what, she said sharply, 
bending her black brows at him. Jack and Jill, he returned carelessly. I broke my crown, you know, and you. He did not finish. She stared at him, trying to keep her face and her composure. But a smile, that on her imperious lips he thought perfectly adorable, here lifted the corners of her mouth. But the smile, and the line of dazzling little teeth it revealed, were unfortunately on the side toward him. Emboldened by this, he went on, I couldn't think what had happened. At first I had a sort of idea that part of a mule's pack had fallen on top of me. Blankets, flour, and all that sort of thing, you know, until her smile had vanished. Well, she said impatiently, until, until I touched you. I'm afraid I gave you a shock. My hand was dripping from the spring. She colored so quickly that he knew she must have been conscious at the time, and he noticed now that the sleeve of her cloak, when and how had she managed to do it without his detecting the act? At all events, she said coldly, I'm glad you have not received greater injury from your mule pack. She did not reply, but remained looking furtively at the narrow trail. Then she listened. I thought I heard voices, she said, half rising. Shall I shout? He asked. No, you say there's no use, there's only this way out of it. I might go up first, and perhaps get assistance, a rope or chair, he suggested. And leave me here alone, she cried with a horrified glance at the abyss. No, thank you, I should be over that ledge before you came back. There's a dreadful fascination in it even now. No, I think I'd rather go at once. I never shall be stronger as long as I stay near it. I may be weaker. She gave a petulant little shiver. And then, they moved from the ledge toward the trail. Suddenly she started back. But it's only wide enough for one, and I never, never could even stand on it a minute alone, she exclaimed. He looked at her critically. We will go together, side by side, he said quietly, but you will have to take the outside. Outside, she repeated, recoiling. Impossible. I shall fall. I shall keep hold of you, he explained. You need not fear that. Stop. I'll make it safer. He untied the large bandana silk handkerchief, which he wore around his shoulders, knotted one end of it firmly to his belt, and handed. Do you think you can hold on to that? I don't know. She hesitated. If I should fall, stay a moment. Is your belt strong? He pointed to a girdle of yellow leather which caught her tunic around her small waist. Yes, she said eagerly, it's real leather. He gently slipped the edge of the handkerchief under it and knotted it. They were thus linked together by a foot of handkerchief. I feel much safer, she said, with a faint smile. But if I should fall, he remarked, looking into her eyes, you would go too. Have you thought of that? Yes. Her previous charming smile returned. It would be really Jack and Jill this time. They passed out on the trail. Now I must take your arm, he said laughingly. Not you mine. He passed his arm under hers, holding it firmly. It was the one he had touched. For the first few steps her uncertain feet took no hold of the sloping mountain side, which seemed to slip sideways beneath her. He was literally carrying her on his shoulder. But in a few moments she saw how cleverly he balanced himself, always leaning toward the hillside, and presently she was able to help him by a few steps. She expressed her surprise at his skill. It's nothing. I carry a pail of water up here without spilling a drop. She stiffened slightly under this remark, and indeed so far overdid her attempt to walk without. But in an instant his arm was transferred from her elbow to her waist, and in the momentum of his quick recovery they both landed panting against the mountain side. I'm afraid you'd have spilt the pail that time, she said, with a slightly heightened color, as she disengaged herself gently from his arm. No, he answered boldly, for the pail never would have stiffened itself in a tiff, and tried to go alone. Of course not, if it were only a pail, she responded. They moved on again in silence. 
The trail was growing a little steeper toward the upper end and the road bank. Ray was often himself obliged to seek the friendly aid of a manzanita or thornbush to support them. Suddenly she stopped and caught his arm. There, she said, 